Welcome to Electronic Materials. This video covers the second half of chapter 1. So far we talked about bonding between atoms and we tried to get an idea of the thermal energy that is in particles in atoms and that allowed us to determine whether a bond is stable or not. And so now the next step here is to discuss what happens when many atoms come together and form uh, crystals. You may wonder why discuss crystal structure in a course about the electronic properties of materials. Well, it turns out that the crystal orientation is very important for semiconductor materials. Their electronic properties depend a lot on the direction into which electrons move as they travel through the crystal. Okay, so let's discuss a little bit the nomenclature that is being used to talk about the crystalline uh, state. So a crystalline solid is a solid in which the atoms are bonded in a regular pattern and that makes it different from an amorphous solid where there is a more chaotic and unordered structure. So in this chapter now we only want to talk about uh, crystalline solids that have a regular pattern. Now if you want to discuss crystals you need to give their structure a name and over here we see that a crystal structure is composed out of a lattice and a basis. The lattice gives us the structure at which the basic units repeat throughout the crystal and the basis is what we put on each of these lattice points. So if we had a, a crystal lattice with a basis that is consisting of two atoms then we would end up with this crystal structure where one of those basis units sits on each of those lattice points. A straightforward example is copper. Copper makes a FCC lattice. FCC means face centered cubic, so we have a cubic structure, one atom on each corner of a cube and then each face also carries one atom. And in this case it's obvious we have a a face centered cubic lattice and the basis is a single uh, copper atom. Here are some more examples of types of crystals. One example is iron. Iron makes a body centered cubic lattice abbreviated BCC and similar to the FCC structure we start out with a ordinary cube of atoms and we add one atom into the center and that makes it a body centered cubic lattice. The next example is graphite, carbon, and here the crystal is a hexagonal close-packed crystal structure that's abbreviated as HCP. And so in a hexagonal structure we have layers where the atoms assume a hexagonal alignment and adjacent layers are a little bit shifted in their um, lattice uh, points, in their lattice positions. The reason for the shift is to increase the number of atoms per volume and that is achieved by putting the atoms of the next layer into the hollows into the uh, underlying first layer. So these structures that you saw here, they are called unit cells of these crystals and the unit cell is defined as being a small fraction of the crystal lattice that uh, shows all the properties of the entire crystal. So it needs to be just big enough to have the entire crystal structure visible and repeating the unit cell would then yield the entire crystal without any additional information. The three examples that I just discussed, they had one thing in common. The bases had just one atom, right? We were discussing copper, iron and carbon. Now here's an example for a crystal where the basis has two atoms. And the example is zinc blende, ZNS. And even though it looks much more complicated, we still have a face centered cubic FCC lattice similar to uh, copper. The difference is that on each lattice point we have now a zinc sulfur dimer. So the, the sulfur sit on the lattice points and in a little distance from them we have a sulfur. It's interesting to note that 
even if we have a substance that is only composed out of one element, like diamond, this is also carbon, it's similar to graphite, just has a entirely different crystal structure. Now diamond makes a FCC lattice again, but on each lattice point we have two carbon atoms. The reason why diamond assumes a face-centered cubic lattice lies in the fact that the carbon atoms arrange in a tetrahedron, like we saw this earlier in the uh, part about uh, covalent bonding. Zinc blended does the same. Here we have the zinc in the center and then we have four sulfurs around and they're also arranged as a tetrahedron. And you can see that a FCC lattice with a monoatomic basis could not accommodate these tetrahedrons because there are no uh, lattice points for these uh, atoms that are at the uh, centers of the tetrahedron. Only the outer atoms are being taken care of by the lattice points. The different crystal structures that I just discussed, they have different number of atoms per unit cell and a different atomic packing factor. So let's have a quick look what that means number of atoms per unit cell that simply you calculate or you just look at these structures here and you determine what part of each of these atoms is inside the cell and what's outside and if you look at the FCC lattice then you can see that the atoms that are on the corners only one-eighth of them is inside the unit cell while the other uh, seven eighths are outside in different unit cells if you would um, uh, add them here to that first unit cell. The number of atoms is eight times one eighth so that's just one and then if we look at the ones that are in the uh, faces here then we have we have six of those and uh, it's obvious that half of each of these atoms is inside the uh, unit cell so that gives us another six times one half and so we know that there are four atoms inside the FCC uh, crystal unit cell. Now here you see a major difference between FCC and and the diamond zinc blender where we have a basis of two atoms that essentially doubles the atom count per unit cell so we have eight atoms in the uh, unit cell. Now looking at the atomic uh, packing factor that simply means um, what percentage of the space of the volume we have inside the unit cell is being filled with atoms and what's filled with a vacuum in between the atoms. It turns out that there are quite significant differences in the atomic packing factor between the uh, crystal structures. The highest atomic packing factor is in the FCC and HCP lattices. It's remarkable that they are exactly the same. The reason for that lies in the fact that FCC is actually also a hexagonal close-packed structure we just show it differently. If you look here at the FCC structure, if you would tilt it by a few degrees that these planes here are horizontal, you could actually see that they are uh, also hexagonally packed. The difference is that the HCP uh, unit cell or the HCP lattice is composed of two types of hexagonally uh, uh, close packed uh, layers while the FCC is composed out of three. The next topic is lattice parameters, crystal directions and planes. Here we learn how to describe directions and planes in crystal lattices. The first step is to define a coordinate system and the coordinate system is essentially given by the geometry of the unit cell and so we have the sides ABC and the angles alpha, beta and uh, gamma. ABC are essentially the length units of our uh, coordinate system. So if you wanted to define a crystal direction all you need to do is draw that vector that you want to describe and then count the lattice parameters to get to that uh, lattice point it goes through from the from the origin. And in this example uh, we would get 1a, um, 2b and 1c and so we end up with coordinates that are 1a, 2b, 1c and abbreviated 
it is uh, given as 1 to 1. If you wanted to describe the vector in the negative direction, it would be minus 1, minus 2, minus 1, and often negative coordinates are shown with bars instead of minus signs. Now that we know how to define a lattice direction, it's easy to move on and define the orientation of lattice planes. It's often said that Miller indices define lattice planes, but that's not the case. Miller indices really define the orientation of lattice planes, and parallel planes, they all have the same Miller indices. A straightforward way to define the orientation of a plane is to define a vector that is orthogonal to the plane. And this is essentially what we end up with once we determine the Miller indices. How do we get the Miller indices? The recipe is written here. So the first step is to find the intercepts of the plane with the lattice axis defined by the unit cell. So this is just our coordinate system that we developed on the last slide. So if we wanted to define the red plane, then we would see here that we have one half A, one B, and never C. And so if it's parallel, if the plane is parallel to one of the axes, we um, put in infinity. And so we get one divided by one half, one divided by one, and one divided by infinity. That directly yields two, one, and zero, right? If you would just calculate these fractions. If we do the blue plane, which is parallel, right, it should give us the same Miller indices, then we find intersects that are 1a, 2b, and still never c, because it's parallel. The reciprocals now are 1, 1 half, and 0. And now, because we have 1 half here, we need to do the third step, which is clear the fractions by multiplying with the least common denominator, which in this case is 2, because we only have one fraction here. And so we end up again with 2, 1, and 0. So you see, if you use parallel planes, you get the same Miller indices. Now, what I said in the beginning is that this essentially gives us a vector that is perpendicular to the, the plane that we are defining. And so I tried to draw this vector that we just got, right? We have 2a and 1b and 0c. So it's this, this orange vector that I drew here. And it seems to look uh, pretty perpendicular, wouldn't you agree? Okay, now that Miller indices are out of the way, let's move on to subchapter 110, crystalline defects. Let's discuss first the significance of defects. Why would we want to talk about defects in a course about electronic materials? Well, defects are critically important for semiconductors because they affect the conductivity profoundly. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as a perfect crystal. All production methods introduce impurities and lattice defects, and so the industry has gone to great lengths to find methods to be able to control impurities with a very high efficiency. In fact, semiconductor materials are probably among the most pure materials found on Earth, and they are routinely controlled to an impurity level that is one part per million or better. Once there is ultra-pure semiconductor material, defects are introduced deliberately in order to tune the conductivity of the semiconductor. This is called doping. Let's discuss point defects first. These are defects that only affect individual lattice sites. This figure shows the basic types schematically. The origin of impurities is twofold. We have either intrinsic impurities that are caused by the uh, crystal itself because it has thermal energy and some of the atoms, as you know now, may have enough energy to be able to jump around inside this lattice. And that can form vacancies and interstitials. Just imagine the atom here somehow boxed its way through to this spot, and so a vacancy and an interstitial atom formed. The other origin of defects is foreign matter, 
impurities that come from the outside that are not part of the uh, crystal material. So this interstitial atom, of course, could also be uh, a different type of atom that is an impurity. Yet another way to create a point defect is by substitution. You see that here, so here in this case, a larger atom, an impurity, replaces one of the uh, regular lattice atoms. When it's large, it stresses the lattice, and when it's small, then the lattice is strained. If we're looking at ionic crystals, then we have Schottky and Frankel defects, and these defects essentially keep the uh, crystal neutral. So in the case of Schottky, positive and a negative ion went missing to create a larger vacancy. And in the case of a Frankel defect, one ion leaves to go elsewhere in the crystal that forms local charge imbalances, but overall the crystal still remains uh, neutral because negative and positive charges still balance each other. Let's have a closer look at these defects. I want to talk first about vacancies and self-interstitial point defects. So self-interstitial are the ones that are made up from atoms of the um, crystal lattice. The interesting aspect of these types of defects is that they are intrinsic of the crystal, so the crystal makes them itself. And as you know now, all these atoms, they bounce around because they have kinetic energy if the temperature is larger than zero. And the interesting fact here is that the density of this kind of defect in a crystal simply depends on its temperature and on the activation energy it costs to be able to uh, move to a different lattice site for one of those atoms. So I hope you are not surprised that the vacancy concentration is defined by an exponential function that uh, has the ratio between the activation energy for this defect divided by kT in its exponent. So again we see the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and it gives us essentially a measure of uh, how many of these defects to find at a given temperature. That means that there are no crystals except at the absolute zero possible that are defect free, that don't have this type of defect. Let's have a closer look at point defects from impurities. Impurities are foreign atoms that occupy lattice points and so they can be integrated as uh, interstitials or as substitutionals. Now the point with impurities is that they are either wanted or unwanted. Our big goal in semiconductor materials is to precisely control the conductivity and the conductivity is determined by impurities. So if we want to control the conductivity we need to have methods to get rid of impurities and then we need to have methods to introduce impurities very deliberately to our benefit. I will discuss a few slides down a crystal growth method that is designed to yield extremely pure uh, crystalline semiconductor materials. But let's focus here now on a method how to implant impurities into a semiconductor wafer. This is done with an ion implantation apparatus, which consists of an ion source that produces an ion beam that is accelerated through an analyzing magnet or a mass spectrometer. Here the beam becomes super pure, right, because the ion source also has impurities and so with the mass spectrometer here we can eliminate unwanted impurities from wanted impurities and then the beam continues into uh, accelerator and then some focusing elements and scan plates onto the wafer. On the wafer the highly energetic ion beam hits the surface of the semiconductor material and the ions are being embedded in a uh, top layer of the uh, wafer. You can imagine that this here produces a surface layer that is not very crystalline anymore because of all this energy and these impacting ions. To reorganize the uh, crystal lattice, the wafer can be heated, which gives all the atoms here more energy so they can wiggle around and find the lattice points again. This process is called annealing. So far I only talked about point defects. 
but there are also other defects that affect a larger part of the crystal lattice. So here this is a schematic of a line defect. There an entire crystal plane is uh, terminated, going missing here in the lower part of the crystal. And that gives rise to a stress and strain field around this uh, transition region. In a screw dislocation, an entire part of the crystal is dislocated relative to the rest. And that gives interesting to these screw shapes like um, defects or structures. Here you see an atomic force microscopy image of such a screw dislocation. Another type of defect that occurs during crystal growth are planar defects, also known as grain boundaries. They happen typically because nucleation during crystal growth occurs in many different spots at the same time. And these crystals while each of them is single crystalline, they have different orientations relative to each other. And as they grow bigger, they run into each other. And once they completely run out of space, the crystal has formed, but it has all these grain boundaries between those individually oriented uh, microcrystals. And that's called a polycrystalline structure. And these boundaries, they are full of interesting defects that affect the electronic properties of these uh, crystals. This is an especially important uh, phenomenon when semiconductor materials are grown as thin films. All the defects I discussed so far were bulk defects. So they occur inside the crystal volume. If we talk about the crystal surface, an entirely different zoo of defects is possible because the surface is of course where the crystal lattice ends and its uh, periodicity is disrupted and that gives host to an entire zoo of phenomena. Uh, some people say the bulk was created by God and the surface by the devil. So let's have a quick look what is possible because the lattice ends, of course, you can imagine, you know now, that some of the uh, valence shells of the participating atoms in the crystal are not fully satisfied. So we have what's called a dangling bond. So that's a bond that really likes to try to react with somebody else. And that makes it actually very difficult to keep a surface clean because it's reactive. It likes to react with other things. And these dangling bonds, even if there are no other impurities present, uh, even in, in good vacuum, the uh, surface of a semiconductor uh, likes to reconstruct. And I will show you a nice example on the next slide about this phenomenon. So. Uh, these atoms in the surface, they start forming additional bonds and that creates, of course, a, a different uh, forces between them and that leads to them changing their position and that creates this reconstructed surface. If there is oxygen or something else present at the surface, of course, then we get reactions. This is what you would get on uh, a silicone surface, for example, if you would break a wafer. Other reactions could happen with hydrogen that is could be present. Uh, water could absorb on the uh, surface, right, through a dipole uh, interaction, secondary binding, the, s the same with uh, uh, hydrogen molecules or with pretty much any other contamination that is present. So surfaces can be very complicated and very difficult to deal with. This here is a famous example of a reconstruction of the silicone 111 surface. It's called the 7x7 reconstruction. And what you see here is a scanning tunneling microscopy image of such a reconstructed surface. Here you see a schematic of a scanning tunneling microscope. This is a microscope with which one can see single atoms on a surface and it operates by scanning a tip across the surface and this tip is held in constant distance to the surface with a mechanism that is so sensitive that it can actually trace the uh, contours of individual atoms and that's what you see here. It's done by uh, passing a current into the sample. This current 
depends very strongly on the distance between tip and sample and by measuring the current one can determine how far the tip is away from the sample. So if the current gets stronger then the piezo tube retracts the tip a little bit and if the current gets weaker then the piezo tube extends the tip a little bit. And this is done by means of a feedback uh, a process and a computer. So the computer knows how this piezo tube is contracting and expanding and from that a, a topography image of the uh, surface that's being investigated can be assembled. And that's what you see here. So there's basically one scan with the tip after the other and we see the, the contours of the atoms expressed as a color change. Now you see here a pattern of very bright ones and if one makes a cut here through the uh, surface and uh, tries to explain how the atoms are arranged, over many years of research they finally figured out that this here is the uh, structure. Now why does this structure form? The reason really is that the 111 surface has one dangling bond per atom essentially and these dangling bonds they are a high energy state and so what the silicon surface does is try to reduce the number of the dangling bonds and it does that by creating this structure. So it moved atoms around and it formed additional bonds and research shows that uh, 49 bonds 49 dangling bonds that existed before the reconstruction were reduced to 19 across this 7x7 area. And so this is a lower energy state and that's why the silicon surface does that. When I started discussing uh, point defects I mentioned there is a method to make ultra pure silicone crystals and this method is shown here it's called Stochalski growth this method grows a huge single crystal. You see it here. This is what's coming out of this process. It's as tall as a person. And this single crystal is pulled out of molten silicone. So there is a, a strong heater and a crucible full with molten silicone and then a seed crystal that essentially defines the uh, lattice planes in this entire uh, ingot as it is called. This seed crystal is dipped into the molten silicone and then super slow pulled out while it is being rotated. And if this is done right then after many hours this uh, huge single crystal is coming out of this molten uh, silicone. Once the ingot has been grown there are still too many impurities in it and for that there is the method of zone refining and zone refining essentially pulls the impurities into molten silicone and moves them to the end of the ingot. So with this heater coil that's moving down the ingot the impurities are being collected and pushed towards the end. And this is done several times and after this process is over then the upper part of this ingot is extremely pure and has fewer than one part per million uh, impurities in it. Once the ingot is pure enough then with a, a wire saw, you see it here schematically, the ingot is uh, sawed into uh, wafer disks that are then the uh, basis for growing integrated circuits. You may have wondered on the previous slide when I uh, said that in zone refining one can collect the impurities in the um, molten phase of the ingot as the heater coil moves along the ingot. And if, if one wants to understand phenomena like this, one needs to understand solid solutions. And this is what uh, subchapter 113 is about. Here we want to discuss what happens if we mix one type of atoms into another. Before we get going, let me define real quick what a phase is. We will use this word uh, quite a bit here in the next few slides. So phases are volumes in a system where the material has the same structure and composition. So if you look at oil in and on water, then one could say the oil is one phase and the water is the other. Let's move on to uh, solid solutions.
We can define solid solutions as mixtures between two or more types of atoms. And generally the major component of such a solution is called the solvent and the minor components are the solutes. One can distinguish between solutions that can exist in any concentration. They're called extended solid solutions. And they have only one phase in any concentration. The prototypical example is nickel copper. We will talk about this in the uh, next few slides. Um, other materials only partially dissolve in each other. That's the more common case, I would say. And this results in solid solutions that are not homogeneous. You see a great example here, the aluminum copper alloy. This here is a uh, image of a cut through one of those crystals that was then polished. And so you see two phases. One looks lighter, the other darker. One of these phases is copper rich and the other is aluminum rich, but there is nothing in between. So when you melt copper and aluminum and then uh, cool it down, then you get a structure like this here. The reason for this is that copper can only be dissolved in aluminum to a certain degree and vice versa. And that's why this splits up into two phases to satisfy this partial solubility of one and the other. In general, there are three basic types of crystal structures of solid solutions. There is random substitutional, that typically occurs when one component dominates. There is ordered substitutional, that usually happens at certain concentrations that are conducive to this kind of structure. And then there are interstitial uh, solid solutions where uh, one atom is much smaller than the other. Now I want to discuss some real world solid solutions. We start out with an isomorphous case, nickel copper. Nickel copper dissolve in each other at any concentration and any concentration solidified has the same FCC uh, face centered cubic crystal lattice. Isomorphous stands for same structure. That means that at any concentration we have the same FCC structure. This also means there's only one solid phase when it's solidified. The copper nickel alloy forms a substitutional lattice because the copper and nickel atoms are very similar. They have the same size or very similar size and also a similar electronegativity so they can replace each other in the crystal lattice very easily. Solid solutions are described by phase diagrams. A phase diagram essentially shows what phases are present at a given temperature and concentration. Here you see the phase diagram of the copper nickel system. On the x-axis you have the weight percent nickel, so here we have 100% copper and over here 100% nickel and then this is 20% nickel and so on. On the y-axis we have the temperature and then we have these two blue lines that are called liquidus and solidus curves. The area that's in between them, that's where liquid and solid phases coexist while above we have the liquid phase and below the solid phase. These liquidus and solidus curves are typically determined from experiment. The way to do it is to make a batch of different mixtures and liquefy them and then measure cooldown curves for each of these mixtures. And these cooldown curves, they are nothing but the temperature over time as the batch cools down. And what you see is, in the case of the pure materials, copper and nickel, the cooldown curve at some point out of a sudden stops and then stays at the same temperature for some time and then starts dropping again. This is a measurement of the melting point. So what happens is the batch gets cooler and cooler and then it starts solidifying. And at this point, some energy is being released because the solid has a lower energy state than the liquid. So this uh, releases uh, some energy as the batch solidifies and when it is completely solidified then the cooldown continues. 
So this is a way to get a really nice measurement for the melting point of a pure material. And for copper, because it has a lower melting point than nickel, the, the plateau here is at a lower temperature and for nickel you get it at a higher. So this gives you this point and this point of this uh, phase diagram. Now the points in between that define the liquidus and solidus curves, they come from those cool down curves of the mixtures. And these curves, they look different at this uh, solidification uh, stretch. They don't go into a plateau where the temperature stays constant, they just slow down a little bit and then resume their original uh, cool down slope. So why does this happen? This happens because here now we don't have a single material, we have a mixture of two materials and one of these materials, nickel, has a high melting point and the other has a low melting point. So there is not a temperature anymore at which all the atoms in the solution try to form a crystal. But there are essentially two, but since these materials are miscible, we have this gradual sliding from liquid to solid uh, process. And what happens is the, the material with the higher melting point, the nickel, starts to solidify first, right, when the temperature uh, is below a certain point. So you can imagine there are some nickel crystals initially forming, but they're incorporating a little bit of copper. And then as the temperature goes down, more and more copper is being incorporated until the entire batch is solidified. And this happens a little bit different for all these different mixtures. That's why the slopes here are a little bit different. And that's why we have this belly shaped, these belly-shaped curves here. But this is essentially how a phase diagram is being uh, assembled from uh, measurements. Okay, let's see what we can do with such a phase diagram. So assume we are here at point A, so we would have a 35% nickel in copper mixture, a pure copper over here and pure nickel on this end of the phase diagram. And now we are cooling this mixture down. Here it's liquid because we are in the liquid phase area. So it's cooling down from point A to point B and at point B, which is very slightly below the liquidus curve, we start getting some crystals floating around in the liquid. And now it is interesting to understand what is the concentration of those uh, crystals because now we have two phases, right? We have the liquid phase and we have the solid phase coexisting at this uh, point here. And this can be read off this phase diagram. It's a very easy thing to do. You simply draw a tie line uh, in parallel to the x-axis from point B to the solidus curve and from point B to the liquidus curve. And then you can read off directly the concentration of the liquid phase at this point. And over here you can read off the concentration of the solid phase. Now for the solid phase we find about 46% nickel. Right, so we have a nickel rich uh, solid at this point because as I said on the last slide, nickel has the higher melting point so it will start solidifying first as the temperature drops. And so the crystal that is forming here has more nickel in it than the average composition of this batch of uh, uh, alloy. So this makes sense. Over here, the liquid at this point is still shown as 35%, but of course it's a tad below 35% because a little bit too much nickel is in these small crystallites here. And so this uh, tendency now emphasizes as we go further down in temperature. So at point C, our tie line yields a liquid that has only 32% uh, nickel in it. And the crystals are still nickel rich, but they are now a little bit weaker uh, in their nickel content. So they have a little bit more copper already because copper starts to sort of being integrated because there's just so much copper. Right? And for copper, it's also nice to be in a crystal and lower its energy, so there's some motivation for these copper atoms to go 
in with those crystals. And this trend continues and continues as, as we reach here point D. D of course is very close to the uh, solidus line. That means that most of the batch at this point is already uh, solidified. So the uh, solid has a composition that is pretty close to the composition of the total batch and the liquid in turn is pretty depleted of nickel at this point. We have only 24% left. And then after we enter into the solid phase and go here to point E, then of course everything is solid. And since no atoms were added or extracted, we still have the same concentration like we had up here in A. But we took a pretty circuitous uh, journey here through various uh, compositions of the uh, solid. And what that means is, of course, if you do this cooldown reasonably fast, then these uh, crystallites that formed during the solidification process, they are not fully homogeneous in this concentration. They will have uh, small parts on the inside that are nickel rich and then as they grow more and more copper got incorporated and so their concentration will be uh, copper depleted on the outside and nickel rich on the inside. This can be repaired in quotation marks by uh, annealing this uh, solid that means just um, heat it for an extended period of time keep it at a temperature so that the atoms have enough energy to to move around and re-establish a homogeneous mixture that is uh, truly 35 percent throughout the entire crystal okay the awesome power of the tie lines doesn't end here the tie lines also allow us to determine the weight fractions of the solid and the liquid phases at any given point on such a, a cooldown curve. For this we start out by recognizing that the weight fractions of liquid and solid together, they always need to be one because we don't add or subtract material during this process. The number of atoms is constant. And that we also know that if we weigh the weight fractions by the concentrations, then after adding them together, we get the average concentration. So these two equations we can solve into the weight fraction of the liquid phase and the solid phase. And so we get these two expressions. And what you see here is that the weight fraction of the liquid phase is just the concentration of the solid minus the average concentration. So this is the right part of the tie line divided by the total tie line. Right here it's the concentration of the solid minus the concentration of the liquid. So this is the red bar here, the red tie line. And Vice versa, for the uh, weight fraction of the solid, we get the, the uh, difference between the average concentration and the liquid concentration divided again by the entire tie bar. And this is called the lever rule. At point C, that's what I selected here. So we have the average concentration, of course, is always the same, 35%. We have the liquid uh, concentration, we read that off from the tie line, so we have 32. And for the solid phase we have 43. Then we can calculate the weight fraction of the liquid phase. 43 minus 35 is 8 and divided by 43 minus 32 is 11 and we can calculate that this is 0 0.73. So we have 70 3% of the batch is liquid at this point and has a concentration of 32% nickel. The solid phase, we do a similar effort here, we end up of course with 27%, uh, right? In total we need to get one. So pretty powerful this phase diagram. We can at any point here we can determine what are the fractions of liquid and solid and we know the concentrations. Pretty awesome, wouldn't you agree? Okay, let's try to put this uh, type of phase diagram to work for a practical application here. I talked earlier about zone refining and how a 
silicone ingot can be purified. So again, the way this works is one puts the ingot in a glass tube that has an inert atmosphere, so no oxygen, nothing can react with the uh, silicone in here. And then a heater coil is being driven along the ingot in a slow speed and wherever the heater coil is the silicone melts and this melted section as it moves along the uh, ingot it collects all the impurities that are in the solid silicone. This is a pretty miraculous process wouldn't you say? But we can try to understand it with a phase diagram. So over here we see a schematic phase diagram of this uh, system and so we say here this is 100% silicone and then uh, on the x-axis we have the impurity content. Of course this is a, a crude approximation because we don't only have one type of impurities and impurities also aren't uh, miscible at any concentration. They are only, most of them are, are only partially uh, miscible. And so this is an approximation but for the purpose of explaining the zone refining process uh, it is uh, sufficient. So the melting point of pure silicone is at 1412 centigrades and now when we heat the uh, silicone up and we have we create a liquid phase then you see here because the impurities have a lower uh, melting point we, you will see here that the tie lines they yield a higher impurity concentration in the liquid than in the solid. And this is the reason why the impurities like to go into that molten phase. And as the molten phase travels down here, it gets impurity richer and richer. Of course, this is counterproductive because the concentration of the uh, impurities goes up. So this is why this process needs to be repeated several times until the silicone is really pure. And the impurity gradient along that ingot, so this is the length of the ingot here, that uh, basically goes up and up and up towards the end where all the uh, impurities are being pushed towards. So for wafers they only use that clean part and the, as they call it, dirty end is being discarded. Okay, let's do something more complicated. The second example uh, about phase diagrams is the binary eutectic phase diagram. You see it here for the uh, lead and tin mixture. So here on the um, x-axis we have the percentage of tin in lead and again here the temperature. But this looks much more complicated than the phase diagram that we had for the uh, copper nickel system. Okay, so what is going on here? The problem, if we can call it a problem, is that lead and tin are not soluble in each other to any degree. We can only put a little bit of tin into lead and vice versa before you get a crystallization of the individual uh, solute. And this is why we have all these additional phases here. So again we have a solid part in this phase diagram. So these are the, the solidly colored areas here, those three. And then we have a liquid part up here, the white part. And then we again have areas where liquid and solid coexist, but we have two. So this here is the solidus line. And this here is the liquidus line in this phase diagram. Let's identify what's in each of these phases. Over here in the alpha uh, phase area, we have the solvent lead and the solute is tin. So here we have a certain degree of solubility of tin. And as we go to higher temperatures, more and more tin can be put into the lead. And over here, this small blue area, that is uh, the uh, area for lead being the solute and tin being the solvent. So this is the beta phase. So here we have a little bit of lead in tin 
and here we have a little bit of tin in lead. Now the, the purple area here, that's where we have alpha and beta coexisting. That means when you are in this region here, you get a inhomogeneous solid that is composed out of distinguishable alpha and beta phases. Typically, it's something that looks uh, laminar or very well separated areas that are interspersed with each other. Something like this here, for example. So here you see dark and, and bright areas and one of them is phase alpha and the other one is phase beta. You may have wondered so far what is this eutectic point that I marked here in bright red. Well, this is a special point because at this point there is no liquid plus solid phase present, right? We are between those two areas. And that means at this point the eutectic solid behaves like a pure solid. During the cooldown curve you get here a plateau instead of that sloped part that we saw earlier at the um, nickel uh, copper system. Now let's do two examples, two example compositions. 40% of tin in lead and the eutectic composition of 61.9% tin in lead. Let's discuss the eutectic mixture first. This here is the cooldown curve. As I just said, it behaves like a pure material, so we get a plateau here. Initially, when we start out at L, we get a temperature drop that then stops at the eutectic temperature of 183 centigrades. Then all the material solidifies and during that process the temperature remains constant because the phase change releases energy. And then we go from point F where everything is solid to point G. And what's happening during uh, this uh, part of the cooldown is that the composition of the eutectic solid that at this point has alpha and beta phases that are of the 19.2 uh, and 97.5 uh, compositions. These compositions change as we go to point G because the solvus curves, they indicate that the solubility of the materials in each other is getting less as the temperature is uh, sinking. That's a similar process like um, if you dissolve sugar in water. If the water is hot, the sugar dissolves much better and you can put uh, more sugar into the water. But as the water would uh, cool down, then sugar would start crystallizing at the bottom of the uh, glass. And so exactly the same thing is happening here. As the temperature drops from F to G, we move down on these solvus curves and that essentially means that alpha phase is shedding tin to the beta phase and the beta phase is shedding uh, lead to the alpha phase. Let's move on to the second example, 40% of tin in lead. So we're looking at this curve. The cooldown curve is shown here. It has an interesting new feature. The solidification stretch is composed of two different regions. One is sloped, similar to the curves that we saw in the isomorphic alloys. And then we also have a component of the solidification that occurs during a temperature plateau. So it seems here we have both things mixed, part eutectic cooldown and part uh, regular alloy cooldown, where liquid and solid coexists. Okay, let's have a look at the phase diagram. So at point L everything is liquid and then the temperature drops and we make it to point M. And at point M phase alpha starts to nucleate. And at that point we have this concentration of alpha. And as the temperature goes further down to point N, then um, so we're now in this uh, sloped solidification part. At point N, the concentration of the alpha phase has changed and the concentration of the liquid, of course, too. The liquid got more tin rich. This continues until we reach point O, which is at the eutectic temperature of 183 uh, centigrade. And at this point, we have a pretty interesting situation. One might think that at this point, because we're touching the uh, solid phase here, everything has solidified already, but this is not the case. When we reach point O, 
there is still about half of the batch liquid and the other half is solid. So we have a situation like this here where we have nuclei floating around in a sea of liquid. We can calculate the weight fractions by using the lever rules like we did it in the isomorphic solution. Remember we have the formulas for the weight fractions here and we can read off the uh, compositions of the uh, liquid and the uh, solid phases at this point, right? The, com the composition of the solid phase is just here 19.2 um, and the composition of the liquid phase is of course the eutectic composition which is 61.9% uh, uh, tin. The average composition of course didn't change because we didn't add or subtract any material so we have 40. Plugging this into the formulas we get a fraction of the liquid phase of 48% and a fraction of the solid phase correspondingly of 52%. So that's pretty interesting, but it makes sense if you look at the cooldown curve, right? We only are done half with the solidification at point O, and we really have to make it to point P if we want to solidify the entire batch, right? Point P is just below that uh, eutectic temperature line here. Finally, after P, when everything is solid, we cool down further and go to Q, and here exactly the same happens like uh, when I talked about the eutectic mixture on the previous slide, alpha and beta phases are changing their compositions because the solubility changes. This concludes the second part of chapter one. Thanks for watching.